So, how would you feel if you won the lottery? Yes, the lottery. Seriously, I don't know who that guy was, but according to the National Endowment of Financial Education, is that 70% of all lottery winners end up bankrupt just a few years after receiving this windfall of cash. So, why do you think that is? Is it a lack of financial literacy? Is it just bad luck? Is it family members asking for money coming out of the woodwork? Nope, not even close. It's one very simple thing. It's called character. That's correct, character. Because money exposes character. It's just simply a magnifier of what's already going on in there and what has been built up over time. So in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad, I'm gonna share with you five character traits of millionaires that you can grow, that you can develop, and you can adopt, so therefore you can become a first generation cash flow millionaire starting in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah I'm getting bigger. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And in this episode, we're going to share with you the five traits of first generation cash flow millionaires. Why? Because character is not only what unlocks the opportunity to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, but also allows you to keep and retain that and pass it on to multiple generations. But before we begin this episode, put in the comment section below and affirm with me, I am becoming a first generation millionaire. I am becoming a first generation millionaire. And if you haven't done so already, our next goal for the Seven Figure Squad is to get to 150,000 subs. Why? Because we're going to award a church, charity, or nonprofit that you and I will crowdsource and nominate and award them $5,000 on behalf of the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel community. So please help us get to 150,000 subs so I can cut this check on behalf of you. So without further ado, let's jump right into this episode. You may or may not recall, but in December, we did a thing called Vlogmas, where every day for the 1st to the 21st, every day we uploaded an episode all up until Christmas. It was the first time doing it in December of 2020. And in one of those episodes, I broke down the five gotchas of money. It was taxation, inflation, losses, healthcare, and procrastination. So here's another gotcha that's not so technical after all. It's called bad character. Well, you and I know what bad character looks like and feels like, lying, cheating, stealing, we can go on and on and on. However, what makes up strong character, good character to become? a first generation cash flow millionaire. So let's take a look at these traits. Number one, self-awareness. Let's unpack self-awareness. You know, self-awareness is like you looking into a mirror and not just looking at yourself, but looking at yourself. Like you're looking for things that identify itself as characters and traits to give you a lens and an access point to see how it can grow and develop certain things about myself. And a lot of those things in a category of self-awareness to become a first generation cash flow millionaire is number one is habits. What are your daily habits? Are they good, they're bad, they're helpful? Are they helping you build you towards your goals? Are these habits serving you? Skills. Sometimes we just don't have the marketable skill to get us up and out to become a first generation cash flow millionaire. We don't have the sales skills, we don't have the marketing skills, we don't have the financial skills, we don't have the leadership skills. The good thing about skills those can always be acquired. The other thing in terms of self-awareness is what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and what do you focus more time on developing and growing? As a quick example, I know what my weaknesses are. And so I find people to help me in those weaknesses. Counsel me, coach me, teach me, lead me in these areas. But I know there's certain areas of my life that I'm naturally strong at and things that I'm naturally good at and have confidence in. It's okay to have both. So don't think, oh, I gotta be great at everything. No, nope, no you don't. So write down what are your strengths and weaknesses and recruit people to help you shore up your weaknesses. Have people that you trust and apply time with and process issues with to make sure that your weaknesses uh, are not keeping you from applying a majority of your strength. The other area is anger. 
and temper. And by the way, guys, just want to let you know, it's very well documented that anger that's not used in a constructive way is extremely destructive. There's nothing wrong with anger. It's a human emotion. You and I both feel anger. Road rage, for example. But does it cause you to step back? Does it cause you to hurt somebody? Does it cause you to disrupt your whole entire day because you're pissed off that somebody cut you off? See, there's natural anger when that happens. But it rage into a temper or an area of physical harm to not only the people that you love and care about that's in your car, but also in the car that cut you off. But apply that to your business. Do you blow up? Do you explode because things aren't going away, financially speaking, or client speaking, or a client quits on you and cancels on you, a contract gets canceled? How do you express that anger in a constructive way? I didn't say remove anger. All I'm saying is allow it to re-channel your focus and attention in a way that helps you. And another one, last but definitely not least, attitude. How many times have you heard from somebody that attitude is your altitude, that attitude determines your altitude, that sometimes people have such a good attitude that no matter what happens to them, you know they're gonna rise up. Or people that uh, always have a bad attitude, nothing good ever happens to them, nothing is ever good enough. Everybody owes them everything. See, that's a bad attitude. And quite frankly, that's one area that you can't help somebody with. That's something they have to self, be self-aware enough to know that, man, I gotta fix this area of myself because I'm not attracting a lot of people that wants to rally behind my cause, that wants to, help me build a company, that wants to help me build a campaign, whatever it is that you're seeking out to do. If you have a bad attitude, nobody wants to be around you. And I'm not even so sure you want to be around you. Okay, number two, humility. So first one is self-awareness, number two is humility. What does humility all involve? Well, here's just a few. Ego, pride. By the way, guys, I love guys and gals with big egos. You have a high self-awareness, self a ident high identity or stuff. I love egos. Just as long as it didn't slide into pride. Like, I'm too cool for school, right? There's nothing wrong with people being high identity. Let's just, I know when I come into a room, I perform. I know when I come into a locker room, I lead. I know when I come to any situation, things get better. There's nothing wrong with attitude. But pride? Listen, pride comes before the fall. Why? Because pride keeps you from being coachable. Pride keeps you from receiving information. Pride keeps you from receiving input and data from other people that are looking at a different perspective from different angles that might improve the situation and you, you got your cup full. You don't want to hear anything. You don't want to improve and worse, you know what to do, but you just don't want to do the work. See, that's pride. The people that we love to see and coach and help are those that are just that. They're coachable, that no matter what their backgrounds are, no matter what their resume is, no matter what their industry experience is, no matter what type of pedigree they come from, they're just coachable. I remember uh, uh, meeting with my mentor, uh, Patrick Bidet for the very first time. At that time I was 41, 42 years old. I said, PBD, I said, coach me, lead me, mentor me. Why? I've been in this, at that time I've been in this industry for 14, 15 years. I know a lot. I've been selling life insurance, I've been selling annuities, but I haven't been able to build a business. I haven't been able to build an agency with agents that build with me and stick with me and want to take on the next level with me. They always leave. So I am 41, 42 years old. I've got zero time to waste. I have a wife. I have a family. I love to have a quality life and spend time with them, but I'm finding myself constantly wrapped up in the business, constantly putting out fires, constantly in a period of frustration. Help me, and I'm willing to be coached by you, and I don't care how much experience I have in this industry, here's my cup, boom. I'm emptying it, and I'm opening it, and emptying it, so therefore you can fill whatever it is I gotta drink. That's coachability. Last one is hunger. Hungry and humble, hungry and humble, hungry and humble. We'll find out how hungry and humble you are when you get a first paycheck of $10,000. We'll see how hungry and humble you get when you have a $20,000 check. We'll see how humble and hungry you become still when you're making $100,000 a month because first generation cash flow millionaires constantly stay hungry and humble. So what happens? Yeah, ask yourself, am I tying my success and identity to a dollar amount? Although we talk about first generation cash flow millionaires, some of you watching this YouTube channel may already be millionaires. Or you're passing on somebody that is already a millionaire. Well, how about $2 million? Well, how about $3 million? How about $10 million? What's the next level for you? Because you have to remember this. Whatever income level you're at right now, whatever success level you're at right now, chances are you're elevating and eventually you get to the top of that current level. 
But you have to understand, once you're at top of that current level that you're at right now, you're now exposed to the bottom of the next level. And then when you get to the top of that next level, guess what now? You've not been introduced to the top of that current level, and you're now simultaneously introduced to the bottom of the next level. So, man, when does it stop? I don't know. For me, it won't. I don't know if it will for you or not. That's why I stay hungry and humble, because to me, my personal opinion, I'm not asking you to follow this route. I probably don't recommend it for a majority of you. But when they bury me in the ground, when they put me in the ground and you're reading my eulogy, you know what I'd love for them to say? Yo, dog, Matt, he gave everything he had to the day he died. Even on his deathbed, he's coaching, he's mentoring, he's serving, he's giving. Even in that final moment, he took his last breath, he's finding a way still to help others. What are they going to say about you? Yo, man, you know, 20 years ago, he could have done this. 30 years ago, he could have done it. Man, when he was younger, if only he did this. Are they gonna say that about you? The choice right now for you to realize that is right now as you're watching this video. If you're affirm with me that that is what you are or, and or that's what you're becoming, put in the comment section below. I am hungry and humble. Hungry and humble. All right, next trait, diligence. Now, I like to unpack the definition of the word diligence through biblical references because this word is a very, very important word to me that really I wanted to search, not just what the Webster's definition of it was, and I'll read it in a second, but also what the Bible says and defines as diligence. With that being said, here's the definition of the word diligence. Constant and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaken, persistent exertion of body or mind. So in addition to that, let's take a look at a few scriptures here about what the Bible says, which is a reference manual slash living word Bible that I love to use without putting any religious context behind this. I'm just reading and tapping into values and principles that have stood the test of time through the Bible. Let's read Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. It reads like this. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. Interesting. Let's go to the next book right after Proverbs, which is Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verses 10. It reads like this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Now, you've got to understand, if you don't know much about the Bible, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes was written by who is considered the wisest and richest king who ever lived, King Solomon, who also, in, in the chapters of the Bible, who's also built one of the biggest, baddest tabernacles in the Bible too as well, and uh, he is the son of King David of the story, David and Goliath. He is the son of King David who beat the giant of the Philistines named Goliath. Just to give you some context, listening to these Proverbs is like listening to a modern day um, uh, Jeff Bezos or a modern day Bill Gates or a modern day uh, Warren Buffett. The guys and gals that's in business, entrepreneurs today, that are multi-billionaires and trillionaires but King Solomon is more wealthier and wiser than all of them uh, based on some of the things he wrote in the Bible, in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Of course, he wrote the book Songs of Solomon. It's another book. But these are some words of wisdom from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Let's go to New Testament in the Bible, which is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It reads like this. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. See, the journey of becoming a first-generation cash flow millionaire requires you to be consistent over a period of time. The oftentimes the attitude is, sadly because this popcorn generation, sadly what people see on Instagram and, and social media and, and other uh, platforms, is that people see people that are young, they're professionals, or they're young and rich, or they're young and just traveling all over the world, and people want that instantly over time. Listen, you don't know a lot of people's situation. However, you know your situation. You know your financial resources. You know your networks. You know the people that you can tap into and leverage and build relationships with and help you get to the next levels of your life. Well, some people were just blessed with a financial head start. If you want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, it's because nobody in your family was a millionaire and taught you the game. And because nobody taught you the game, you weren't speaking the right language. And since you weren't speaking the right language, you weren't acting the right things. And since you're acting upon the right things, you have what you have today. And that's why for people like myself, because nobody helped us think like a millionaire, nobody helped us act like a millionaire and speak like a millionaire. In my late teens and early 20s, I never became a millionaire until what? Until pain 
and suffering and guidance and desire and will and wanted to be somebody, all started to combine together in these moments for me to actually do something about it. And that's why I define it as what is building your character. All right, so let's get back, back to the fourth trait. Fourth trait of becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire is keeping your word. How many times are you frustrated because you uh, go to uh, rent an apartment or go buy a house or uh, apply for a car loan or get a credit card and you get denied? You get denied because why? Because you either have no credit or low credit or poor credit. If you had good credit, boom, approved, right? And so the reason why a lot of people never become a first generation cash flow millionaire is because the credit score of your journey to becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire is keeping your word. Keeping your word. When you say something, are your words worthy of depositing into the bank? Or are you just talking smack? You just talk smack, say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and never follow through. Is that you? And by the way, I'm not trying to call you out here. I'm just trying to make you aware of a character trait because other people don't believe you. I get it. But do you believe you? I mean, there's somebody, you can lie to everybody else. But if there's somebody you can never lie to for the rest of your life, it's who? It's the man or the woman in the mirror. If you're constantly saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but deep down inside you're not willing to do the work to get it, then what makes you think that you can say and get away with saying, I'm going to do this, and actually your actions are speaking so loudly, we can barely hear what you're saying, and you can't even hear what you're saying. But the opposite is true. If you are careful about the promises you say and follow through with and come through with, guess what starts happening to you? Instead of lacking confidence, you actually start building confidence. That when you walk into a room and things are about to get done, boom. Not only is that a person a leader, that person is a leader because they follow through with their word. That when they say something, people respect them, people act upon it because they've built a track record of following through with their word. Listen, my father and I, uh, we've had a pretty interesting relationship throughout my adult life. My father, although present in my life in many, many areas, very absent. Typical Filipino father, anytime he opens his mouth, is because he thinks you're doing something wrong. <laughs> right? And it's from an area of love, because they don't want you to screw up. But in the meantime, they're not giving you any guidance, they're not giving you any uh, ideation, they're not giving you any thought process of how to improve your life. It's all about, hey, hey, you're screwing up, you're screwing up. Don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. To the point where I felt my adult, I just stopped listening. Because I didn't want to hear anymore how many times I was screwing up without offering a solution and a solution of credibility to make sure that there's a solution that will far surpass the pain that I go through by implementing that solution and there's a better life and a better outcome. I didn't have that example. I think many of you watching this YouTube channel or part of our Seven Fears Squad YouTube community, I think many of you didn't have an example growing up of how a generational, first generational millionaire builds wealth and creates wealth and passes on wealth. You know, oftentimes I ask at our seminars, how many of you were raised by somebody that made six figures? Not a lot of hands go up. A few hands here and there. When I say $500,000, less hands go up. When I say a million dollars, literally no hands go up. <laughs> and, and I say legally, <laughs> okay? And so when I am asking you right now, how many of you were raised by somebody that was speaking the language of being a millionaire in your life as a youngin, and then as you grew, you were built and fed this character, these words, these uh, uh, um, activities, this exposure to people that live that type of life, that operate in that type of world. How many of you are exposed to that? Matter of fact, a lot of you, I think, were raised in an area where you're just hustling and grinding, and people were talking a lot of smack, but not really following through it, and you thought that was normal. So when you're looking at this area of the traits of becoming a first generation millionaire, be careful of the promises that you make careful the promises that you declare. Because in the world of the universe, for lack of a better term, whatever you say, you better come through with. Why? Because when you come through with it, you build confidence. You don't come through with it, you may not feel it right away, but you actually lose confidence. And you keep saying things you don't mean, you start losing confidence, lose confidence, and worse, people around you, they lose confidence in you too as well. So the choice is yours. You say things, you follow through. Or you say things you don't follow through, whichever outcome that you prefer, you will do. So if you're firm with me that you're gonna come through a third, put in the comment section below, I am a man or I am a woman of my word. Put in the comment section below if that's who you say you are. And last but not least, 
Fifth trait of becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire is consistency. It's different than diligence. Diligence just means you just get the job done. Consistency means, well, how long can you keep the job done? Because there's more things that evolve and come up as you journey through becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire. Can you be consistent over an extended period of time? Just because you make $50,000 a month, you make a large commission check or you have a large or a large contract, doesn't mean that's going to come in every month or every year. Guess what you have to do? You have to find another gig. You have to find another contract. You need to start a process where you're scaling your business so more and more people are doing what you're doing without you physically having to be there. But that happens over an extended period of time. For the first 12 years of my sales career as an insurance agent, I was very, very frustrated because the moment I stopped selling life insurance or buying leads or putting them together at dinner seminar, guess what happened? My cash flow would stop, but didn't mean my bills would stop. I still have to pay rent, I still have to pay my staff, I, have to, I still have to pay my kids school and activities, uh, food, everybody eats, no matter what, people still eat. But if I stop being consistent, not only does my confidence being reduced because I'm just getting dragged down by the drama of bill collectors and all these things I gotta pay, but guess what I don't wanna do anymore? I don't wanna be in this journey. So there's a difference between being a net worth paper millionaire and becoming a first generation cash flow Millionaire, and which do you think is more powerful? Somebody that's a millionaire on paper or somebody that's bringing in a million dollars in revenue every year who has more control, who has more excitement, who has more fun? Put in the comment section about who you think that person is. But when I'm talking about consistency here is, how do you treat your conflicts and your setbacks? Because what will keep you from being consistent is that when health issues come up, how long does it take you out of the game? When family issues come up, how long does it take you out of the game? When you had a bad day, you had a client cancel on you, you had an argument with your spouse, you had an argument with your kids, you had an argument with your business partners. How long does it keep you out of the game and keep you from performing and taking care of the responsibilities of running your business, of executing your business plan, and continue to be diligent in your work? Does it take you an hour? Does it take you two hours to get over things? Does it take you a week? Does it take you a whole month? Does it take you 90 days to get over when things don't go right and don't go your way? See, here's the thing about wealth building. The best of the best anticipates distractions. The best of the best anticipates that things will set them back. That's why, sadly, a lot of people are cash flow millionaires and the next year they're not cash flow millionaires anymore because they forgot to keep reinvesting back into the business because they're celebrating on their success too soon. They're not reinvesting back into creating uh, more infrastructure and reinvesting and considering more solidification to how they built their money. So you got some people that are what we call flash in the pan. Boom, they did it, they got it, boom, and they're gone. That's called flash in the pan. But if you wanna be a first generation cash flow millionaire and have it sustainable over a period of time, so therefore you can pass on what you've learned, not only knowledge and experiences, but also have financial inheritance to the next generation, so therefore your kids, your grandkids can also learn how to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, well, my friends, you've gotta be consistent. Because when distractions come your way, and they will, when conflicts come your way, and they will, you have to anticipate that. Does it keep you from performing what we call money-making activities? See, the thing with entrepreneurs, the thing with capitalists, the thing with guys that operate in the world of free enterprise, is that we're free to buy, we're free to sell, we're free to win, but at the same time, we're free to fail. You gotta understand in a free enterprise system when competition forces us to get better or otherwise we're out of business or we're set back in business, the four, five, six, seven, ten, whatever it is, money making activities that you need to focus on day to day, week to week, month to month, must be executed. If not, guess what? You start to deflate this millionaire balloon that you started to create and you cause yourself to take a dip and sadly that tip takes years to recover from. So, keep this in mind. Once momentum and consistency is on your side, keep dancing with momentum, keep dancing with consistency. My observation, my own mentor, Patrick Bet David, what did he do in social media the other day? He's built an insurance marketing organization, now he's built a media company, and he's continued to evolve the company. The same areas that I just explained here, he's multiplied times five, times 20, times 50, times 100, times 1,000, a couple days ago, he just said, hey, I want to start a campaign called the Reunited States of America. Interesting, huh? the Reunited 
states of America. So what? Now we're divided states of America. And what do you say? You said, I want to get both sides to talk. All these enemies political and his political agenda. I want the Democrats to talk, I want the Republicans to talk. So what do you say? I'm putting together money for both Obama and Donald Trump to have a conversation. And when they do come together in a conversation, I'm gonna give them five million dollars. And this got everybody jacked up. This got everybody say, hey, Patrick Bidave, here's five hundred thousand dollars, here's a hundred thousand dollars, here's to the point right the recording of this video. Over $5.6 million has been raised so far of the targeted $5 million to get both Obama and Donald Trump, not in a political environment, but to come together and share ideas on how to reunite America. And see, that's what we're talking about. See, this is what happens when somebody who doesn't come from this country is exposed to these type of character traits and then finds a platform and finds an industry to make their money in and continues with the same character traits and habits in other industries that's what Patrick McDavid has not only shown himself and his family, but also shown us that he's coaching and mentoring and obviously putting that into practice, not only in his personal life, but also that we're now able to adopt those things and put into practice in our lives. And hopefully, if you're watching this video, you're also putting it into practice in your life. So as I wrap up, this past April, many of you may or may not have seen my most favorite interview was an interview with Rabbi Lappin. He talked about the spiritual side of money, which by the way, let me preface it before you jump on me, he didn't talk about anything religious or faith uh, 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 connected to uh, Muhammad or God or Jesus or Buddha. He said that money is more spiritual than people realize. What do you mean by that? He said spiritual in a sense of things that sadly cannot be measured. You see, you can measure things on a spreadsheet, you can measure things in, in bars and grass, but spirituality and the spiritual side of money, not so much. You can't necessarily measure that. And money, for many people, especially first generation cash flow millionaires, and decade millionaires, and billionaires, there's a very deep spiritual aspect when it comes to money. However, that being said, if you focus in on these character traits that sadly sometimes is not so easy to measure on a day to day basis, kind of like your uh, gas on your gas tank or the speedometer in your car. These things here, not necessarily easily measured. That's why these are. Some would consider the spiritual context of becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire. Because I'll tell you this, here in America at least, there's so many different ways. I mean, you Google right now on YouTube, there's so many different ways to make $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year, making seven figures a year, eight figures a year. There's so many different ways to do it. But what keeps people from actually executing and doing it? Like so many times, some of the people will watch this video and say, can you just tell me what to do, tell me what to do, tell me what to do? Yes, we are telling you what to do, but you want me to spoon feed you. See, actually, you know what you need to do but you're just not doing it, because you're not what? Diligent. It's so easy to find an industry to make money in. You can find so many different ways to make money here in the world of business. Making seven figures, making a million dollars, six figures, being a decade millionaire is not that difficult if you are willing to do it for an extended period of time, be diligent at it, and incorporate some of these things I just talked about in your life. And not only will you experience these things, if you follow through with these traits, my friends, not only you get it, I believe that you will be able to keep it. So as a quick reminder, as I wrap up this video, our next goal of the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel is to get to 150,000 subs. Please help us get there so therefore we can run a $5,000 check to a church charity or nonprofit in the name of the Seven Fear Squad YouTube community to that nonprofit church or charity. And before I let you go, there's a couple of videos here I'd like for you to check out too as well. Number one is the five gotchas of money that I referenced earlier in this video. So therefore you can understand as you're building the money, it's a little bit more of a how-to skills-based video how to avoid the five gotchas of money. So therefore, when you're making it, you're not losing it, you're keeping it. And also number two, a video here on how millionaires get things done. That being said, guys, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Thank <laughs> you.